So how did you become interested in gerontology? It's a something somewhat circuitous route. Um, I went to medical school, trained in internal medicine, and was a general internist. I was a in faculty member in the general internal medicine section at Temple University School of Medicine, my first job after residency training. And as far as I knew, I was an expert in aging because I knew how to take care of high blood pressure and diabetes and heart failure, and I could do it very well. Um, halfway through my time there as a faculty member at Temple, my section chief told me that he wanted me to write a grant about aging and that I should go talk to this woman, Bernice Parlack, who ran the Geriatric Education Center of Pennsylvania. So I went to talk to Bernice. And Bernice said, I'll be happy to share information with you if you will participate in our training program. Mm -hmm. And it was a 40-hour intensive and then a year's worth of follow-up activities. And 40 hours of an intensive sounded interesting, um, so I did it. And that was a real aha moment for me because I got a chance to realize that there was a lot more to geriatrics and gerontology than just being good at those things that I trained for in residency training. That you know there was the whole issue of the individual in their family system, their social system, society as a whole, lots of things related to the basic biology of aging and neuroscience and things that I wasn't really uh, particularly adept with uh, initially. Um, so I was very grateful for that 40-hour intensive and then the year's worth of follow-up that required that I be, you know, do a project and become uh, more skilled. Um, so that was a real, you know, that was my epiphany, my real awakening, my means of saying that that's something that I wanted to do. I have to admit that I was kind of predisposed to it because in the years, those first few years before I did the training that they offered, uh, the patient base for our general internal medicine section was a health maintenance organization. Mm -hmm. And so I went from seeing a lot of older, ill people to some very young, very healthy people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't find them as, inter as interesting. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the diseases that were challenges to me as a trained internist. And they just weren't as interesting to talk to. So I guess I was ready and receptive uh, for that sort of training and, and came to realize that yeah, there was a whole new world. So. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of years after I did that training, for the first time they offered uh, the certifying examination in geriatrics. Um, and so um, I sat for that exam. Um, at that point you could become a board certified geriatrician based upon years of experience caring for older um, adults or from having done an even more formal training program than I did. As I said, mine was 40 hours and a year of follow up. Uh, at that point there were training programs that were two-year training programs mm -hmm. uh, but they were not yet you know, there was no certification so sat for the exam uh, passed that exam and you know my life kind of went on from there um, I had an opportunity to meld the uh, training and skills I developed with the geriatric education center and to continue to work with them as a faculty member in their various trainings across the state of Pennsylvania um, about another five years after that, um, my home state of Oklahoma gave me an opportunity. Um, my sister had moved back to Oklahoma. I'd gone to visit her. To, you know, she's my younger sister. I had to check on her and responded to this ad that they had for a general internist in the uh, general internal medicine section at the University of Oklahoma. I uh, looked and went for the visit. They made me an offer I couldn't resist. Mm -hmm. And I moved back to Oklahoma, very specifically with the charge of leading their um, educational programs and research programs in geriatrics. Um, so you know, my whole identity then was focused on geriatrics and gerontology. Um, and it's been a great ride since then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you started to answer this question already, um, but uh, can you just from that point kind of describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist? Okay. Well, from that point, um, there were Oklahoma was a really good place. You know, it was um, a lot of really smart people, a lot of good resources, um, and you know, a lot of. Um, there weren't a lot of established things in geriatrics and gerontology, so opportunities as a result of that. Um, there was a rehab uh, program focused on older adults that I got involved with. Um, the first geriatric education center grant uh, 
uh, ultimately did come within a couple of years of my arrival that was done uh, generated by a colleague um, and there was an opportunity to just put your head down and, and start doing things uh, started off with just seminars within the Department of Medicine, General Internal Medicine section and then within the Department of Medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, then the VA decided that they wanted to do something more with mm -hmm. regards to geriatrics and uh, my department chair got me involved with that, um, starting off with developing a nursing home within the VA hospital space. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was given the opportunity to lead the team that designed that. We decided we didn't want a typical nursing home. There were plenty of nursing homes in Oklahoma at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we decided to make it a rehab focused center. Um, and that was a lot of fun. It got, there was a lot of um, helping people to recognize the importance of rehabilitation mm -hmm. for older adults mm -hmm. um, and getting them beyond that uh, mindset that you're going to warehouse people, mm -hmm. uh, both staff that were providing the direct care and the administration, uh, mm -hmm. but we were successful in doing that. Uh, my colleague who brought in the Geriatric Education Center grant had, you know, a number of us who were involved. He decided to go on to another opportunity, so I ended up taking on that responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. So that was fun, uh, bringing together faculty not only from OU, but from uh, universities and colleges throughout the state uh, to do training of uh, healthcare professionals uh, on geriatrics issues and gerontology issues. Um, I think from there, then uh, the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation decided that they wanted to do something in geriatrics um, and they wanted to do it in either Oklahoma, Arkansas, or uh, Nevada, the states where Mr. Reynolds had lived, and they got uh, Robert Butler as their consultant. Mm -hmm. And Robert Butler said that if you really want to have an impact, you should do something to impact upon physicians, because physicians tend to lead the medical team. Mm -hmm. And the way to affect physicians is to affect their training. Um, he had established the first Department of Geriatric Medicine in the United States at Mount Sinai. He recommended that they look at establishing departments. And so um, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Nevada got the opportunity to compete for this department. Um, I was the uh, physician lead of our team, but a number of people at OU collaborated on this. In fact, um, I think I told my provost at the time that it kind of looked like an elephant that was designed by a committee. <laughs> <laughs> I also told them that I thought that Arkansas was going to win this competition because they virtually had a department. They'd had a geriatric research and education uh, uh, research Education and Clinical Care Center since 1979. This is the uh, late 90s that we were doing this competition. And um, you know, they, were, they were really well pos uh, positioned to go forward. Um, so all three states submitted uh, uh, a proposal. Arkansas did get the money. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a very good experience because I worked closely with the dean and the provost and some lead the staff in the administration for the College of Medicine, the provost in particular said, well, this is a good idea and I think we should do it anyhow. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna get some money for us to do that. So he went to the state and got some of the money that this, you know, wasn't as much as we proposed, but some of the money the state uh, had promised. And then we went to the VA and the VA put money towards it and we established a Department of Geriatric Medicine. I was the founding chair of that. Uh, it was all three of us, <laughs> me, another geriatrician, and um, uh, uh, an, an education specialist who came from the Geriatric Education Center. Um, the other geriatrician was from our Geriatric Medicine Fellowship Program. I guess I forgot along the way we established Geriatric Medicine Fellowship Program. Um, and uh, that was a really wonderful opportunity as well because we were able to meld together resources from the VA, resources from the university, people from the Geriatric Education Center. Um, and got started. And the Reynolds Foundation found it fascinating. In fact, I got a call from Dr. Butler and he said, Marie, would you say that, uh, do I understand correctly that you're establishing a department? I said, yes, sir, that's, that's the case. And he said, could you say that that's a result of um, the Reynolds opportunity? I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, well, that's very good to hear. And, mm -hmm. uh, we had a grand opening and some of the Reynolds people came to visit. And next thing you know, they asked us to submit a proposal for mm -hmm. a department. Mm -hmm. This time, we already, we had, you know, it was, I guess, a year and a half into the department having been established by then, and we had a little bit of a track record of, 
you know, how we wanted to do things and interacting with students and residents and fellows. And we got a chance to craft something that was much more, um, much leaner and more um, representative of a good, solid gerontology geriatrics training program from my viewpoint. Um, and we were successful. In fact, we got more money than the Arkansas folks did <laughs> on their initial. And, and it was the largest uh, grant that had come to OU Health Sciences Campus at, the, at that point. It was $11.5 million, uh, $10 million of it for endowed chairs for clinician educators, another one point five to help us uh, operationally. And combining that with the money we had from the state and the VA, a very nice package. Um, with the expectation that by, uh, it was a five-year grant, by the end of the grant, we would have recruited a sufficient number of faculty uh, and gotten things organized in such a way that we could have a required geriatrics rotation for all third-year medical students. Uh, and that's in, in keeping with what Dr. Butler was saying. If you want to influence things, you influence the docs, get them early. Um, and, um, you know, some people on the health sciences campus thought we were crazy. I was in particular, because there are 150 medical students each year that you'd have to uh, train, and you're starting with three faculty, um, or three full-time faculty. Um, when I went to tell the chairman of the Department of Medicine that we were making our own separate department, and you know, we no longer, I'd no longer be able to be in clinic with him, he said, you know, Marie, if you were a cardiologist and making a lot of money, I'd be really upset. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we started off, you know, with a lot of non-believers, mm -hmm. uh, but it worked out, you know, uh, between a very supportive administration there, resources, and, you know, a lot of really committed people, mm -hmm. again, the people at the VA, people involved with the Geriatric Education Center, we were successful in recruiting faculty to go into those endowed chairs and in establishing sites to do this required rotation for the third year medical students. And so by the end of our five years of the grant, we met and exceeded all of our milestones, which was really exciting, really exciting. Um, along the way, things like an F5 tornado that made a faculty member who we were trying to recruit not come because his, oh. wife, his wife didn't want to deal with living in that environment. But, you know, we still, we still did it. Um, and we were sufficiently successful that the Reynolds Foundation was receptive to another grant proposal from us, uh, and that was to add another six endowed chairs for uh, researchers. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to do that. Um, and successfully rec recruited uh, a really wonderful researcher from Lake Forest, who uh, then, since then has really built things very nicely. Um, so it's, it's been really an exciting, exciting development along the way being involved with organizations like the Gerontological Society, AGI, American Geriatric Society, great outlets, not only for me personally, but for all the faculty within the department, um, mm -hmm. getting a chance to um, meet colleagues from across the country, work with people across the country, um, all ultimately to the end of um, better developing knowledge and disseminating that knowledge mm -hmm. in geriatrics and gerontology. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when Richard Hodes uh, uh, offered this position to me to be the deputy director of the National Institute on Aging. Um, it was an exciting opportunity as well. Um, I felt like uh, the time in Oklahoma had been very productive, but you know, you always want to leave while things are really good. <laughs> and after a certain period of time, every place needs new leadership. You know. Things get stale if you have the same person, I think, if mm -hmm. you have the same person in place for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so I made that transition um, about uh, now it's going on seven years ago, and it's been really good as well mm -hmm. because it's been an opportunity to see on a national and international level what's happening in the research. You know, this is the evidence that we used in training our medical students and residents, et cetera, and mm -hmm. I, I'm in the middle of that knowledge generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, even more, I mean, I've learned so much neuroscience and so much basic biology, um, and I've had a chance to uh, really appreciate uh, some of our gerontologists in a way that you know was not necessarily feasible when I was really focusing on clinical matters in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's all been really, I've been very fortunate. I should knock on wood here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so at what point in your career did you embrace? the term gerontologist to describe yourself? Um, you know, as you hear, I say geriatrician slash gerontologist. Um, 
and it's hard to really pin that down. Um, I think certainly immediately after doing the training with the Geriatric Education Center of Pennsylvania, I saw myself as a geriatrician. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess maybe while in Oklahoma, as we were being much broader with the Geriatric Education Center and trying to include people from the College of Allied Health and from the College of Pharmacy mm -hmm. and College of Nursing, I much more strongly embrace that concept that I'm a gerontologist. I'm not as strong a gerontologist as some of my colleagues. You know, I'm strong in a particular aspect of gerontology, that's the geriatric medicine aspect of it, and there's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it was probably while I was in Oklahoma, because mm -hmm. as you interact with your colleagues, you recognize that every member of the spectrum has something special to bring um, to help in the figuring out this aging thing. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. Did you have any female mentors uh, who impacted you um, in gerontology? Yeah, in gerontology, I think Bernice Parlack would be the person that I'd uh, mention. You know, Bernice was the person who was in charge of the Geriatric Education Center of Pennsylvania. Um, we continued to be in contact for quite a while after that. Um, she gave me lots of opportunities while in Pennsylvania to present, etc. In my early years in Oklahoma, um, you know, when there was the need for someone to be on a review panel, she was running the uh, Health Resources Services Administration Geriatrics Program by then. Uh, when there was someone who, need, who was needed to be on a review panel, you know, she'd think about me, and so she's she's been very helpful to me throughout my uh, career as a gerontologist. Um, unfortunately, there have not been a lot of others. Uh, of course, I'm an older woman, and. Uh, my generation, I think, is the first group where you see numbers of women in gerontology. They're just uh, a few ahead of us, uh, mm -hmm. so there weren't that many to provide that sort of guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think is unique about being a woman gerontologist? Mm -hmm. I think, as a woman, um, and this is showing bias, uh, but if you're a woman who's had children, um, you probably have developed an appreciation, if it's not something that's innate, for multidisciplinary interactions, balancing a lot of things at one time, uh, <laughs> dealing with teams, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. that I've seen sometimes some of my male colleagues struggle with, mm -hmm. uh, particularly those who see themselves as truly just a geriatrician. Uh, uh, in general, however, people in the field are just very good, generous, open, collaborative people. So it's not a common uh, a problem or difference. But you know, women may have a slight edge along those lines. Yeah. Um, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your personal aging uh, process? That's a very good question. Uh, the, I, you know, I've been dealing with that a lot lately because I have one of those landmark birthdays coming up. Um, haven't heard a lot from uh, Medicare yet, but it's coming. <laughs> and I've been thinking about, um, you know, people talking about the third age, and you know, a lot of friends are already beginning to retire or have retired, and, um, and it, it's been very interesting thinking about that because I think we always kind of see ourselves as we were when we were teenagers or in our 20s and then you go to the gym and you bother you and your knees bothering you and think what in the world happened there <laughs> so as a result of what I know however I think I am able to think about this third age in a less panicked fashion that might be the case um, I see from my friends and colleagues, patients who I used to take care of, you know, when I was in my 30s and they were 30 years older than me, um, sometimes real panic about this and, you know, not wanting to accept the fact that this is, the, this is a natural part of life, the alternative is not desirable because you'd be dead. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's helping me to think about, um, you know, health habits, to think about, you know, what's the next big challenge and opportunity that I want for myself. Am I going to continue doing this ad infinitum? As I said, I don't necessarily believe that for any organization it's good for a person in a leadership role to stay there forever and ever and ever. 
Uh, but you know, when do I make that transition? What do I transition to? What do I really want to do? And there's so many options. It's uh, that's that's the only thing that I'm really finding difficult. You know, we always say to people as they're um, dealing with their maturation that they should have their things that they want to do and that they want to pursue. I have so many things I want to do. You know, how am I going to have time to do all this? <laughs> uh, but it's, um, it's it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's all. You know, I'm looking forward to the future. So the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists, and within that framework, um, is there anything else you want us to know? Well, I mean, I would just hope that other women who are uh, following along um, just continue to embrace the joy of this field. Uh, you know, there's um, nothing like helping with the quality of life of another individual, particularly an older individual, and sharing their stories. I mean, again, back when I was in the general medicine section at Temple, I really enjoyed talking to my older, older patients much more than my younger patients because the younger patients just didn't have the depth of experience. Uh, um, so I, I'd say enjoy the ride, um, keep your balance uh, because there will be those challenges that uh, will want to throw you off. Uh, and um, I've of late picked up yoga and they say be present, be in the moment, you know, absolutely because that moment's gone before you know it. <laughs> so that's what I recommend.